So we're going to start, okay? Hi, everybody. Welcome to this week's Fireside Fire Drill. I'm so glad you're here. And now, our good news for today, first and surprisingly, comes from Unilever one of the world's largest consumer goods companies now plans to remove the fossil fuel based ingredients in their cleaning products. Benzene, a chemical found in crude oil is used to make so many things people use every day, including Unilever's cleaning products. But now they're planning to change that. Unilever has a long way to go before they're, you know, considered a climate conscious company, but this is a great first step. And hopefully a lot of other companies will follow their lead. Thank you, Unilever. Also, here's another one. This is so cute. Remember Taliqua, the beautiful mother orca who spent 17 days gently pushing her dead calf in the water while she was mourning? I mean, wasn't that heartbreaking? She became a, a real symbol of the plight of the southern resident whales, of which there were just 88 when they were listed as endangered in 2005. Then their numbers have gone down even further since then. Well, now, good news, beautiful Taliqua has given birth again. The birth of a beautiful new orca, which was seen for the first time by researchers this last Saturday, which now brings the population to 73. It's reported that the baby looks energized and healthy and we're rooting for you, mama and baby. So that's good news. And now a quick reminder about how to get involved with us at Greenpeace and Fire Drill Fridays. If you haven't already, please text Jane to 877-877. We have many exciting volunteer opportunities that you can do from the safety of your home. You know, all over the world, as water dries up, farmlands turn to desert, Coastal areas flood and permafrost melts. Ecosystems can no longer support the communities they once did. And experts say it's, it's gonna get much worse in the coming years. The World Health Organization predicts that as many as 200 million climate refugees will be on the move by 2050, 200 million. The UN Refugee Agency reports that already 71 million people have been forced from home, more than half of whom are younger than 18. This is the highest number of displaced people the agency has ever recorded. Along with apocalyptic fires and floods and rising sea levels, the increasing numbers of climate refugees have been forcing more and more people to acknowledge the climate crisis is not a, a future danger, but an immediate right here and now reality. I mean, people were shocked and saddened. You remember this by the photo of an immigrant child who drowned in the Mediterranean as his family fled Syria's drought and war. And then there was another image in 2019 of a father and daughter face down, arms thrown across each other's backs on the banks of the Rio Grande. I mean, these, these photos show the consequences of the dangerous journeys that families undertake when their lives at home become unsustainable. Last winter, when we were in Washington with Fire Drill Fridays, a young documented woman named Claudia Quinones spoke at one of the, the fire drills. And she described what it was like being six, seven years old in Honduras, unable to grow food like her family always had because of the long drought. And they couldn't afford to buy food. And besides, she said there was no food. People were killing each other over basic necessities like food and water, she told us. <laughs> People like Claudia didn't cause the climate crisis. The fossil fuel industry did and the United States and other, and other industrialized country. But she, Claudia and people like her are the ones that are bearing the brunt, the consequences. And we can't find it in our heart to help, to want to help these people. I mean, just the journey across desolate and dangerous landscapes is harrowing. 
many die along the way, murdered, raped, starved, without water. I mean, can you imagine? We should all try to imagine the pain and the hardship and desperation that fuel their desire to make the trip in spite of the difficulties. Now, more than anything else, the issue of immigrants shows us that the climate crisis and how we handle it is about justice, okay? Do we decide to erect taller walls and enact stronger immigration policies to keep people out and protect what we see as ours? Or do we open our arms to embrace the strength of immigrants who come seeking to build new lives here as the majority of our families have done? Because unless we're indigenous, you know, connected to one of the 574 native tribes in this land, we are all immigrants. And as we face this triple crisis today, the climate crisis, the COVID pandemic, and the uprisings following George Floyd's murder, we have to make fundamental choices about who we are, who we want to be. Do we want dog whistling, whistleblowing politicians and their supporters pointing us down a path where rich people refuse to acknowledge the climate crisis, blame problems on big government, immigrants, and people of color, convince the working poor to blame them as well, hoard what's left of the spoils, reinforce individualism by making sure that their own kind are taken care of, oh yeah, and locking everybody else out and sowing barbarism at the borders. Is, is, this, is this the world that we want? I don't think so. There is another way. You know, we can, we can share nature's resources and we can look after each other. We urgently need new immigration policies and laws. This is true. And you, you know that during two Republican administrations, Ronald Reagan's and George H.W. Bush's, the approach to immigration and refugees was very different. They abolished immigration prisons altogether and instituted pilot projects that offered support and help to migrants, which consistently showed success. And there was no problem, no big deal, no upswing in crime. On the contrary, and yet, look where we are today. What this shows is new laws and policies are critical, but not enough. We also need to change our feelings, our, our attitude toward immigrants. If we win good policies, but hatred and blame continue to fester in too many Americans, we remain just one bullying, racist, autocratic president away from climate apartheid. See, it isn't, it isn't just the planet's life support systems that are unraveling before our eyes. So too is our social fabric on so many fronts at once. But if we remain active and vigilant now and after the election, we can start to put in place the scaffolding that can solve the empathy crisis, the inequality crisis, and the climate crisis at the same time. The Green New Deal resolution is the way. It shows us how to do it. It's the, the vaccine that we need to start curing our society of the ills that we've brought, that have brought us to, to where we are today. Now, I want to I wanna welcome a man. He's our guest today, Sakit Sony, And I'm so glad he's the guest today. He understands what's wrong and has been finding ways to make it better. Sakit is originally from New Delhi, India. He's a labor organizer and founder of an organization called Resilience Force. Resilience Force is the national voice of a new workforce, the resilient workforce, which is a new kind of climate defender that we're all depending on. Resilience workers are people who help repair and build America after climate disasters. Most of these workers are immigrants. And as global warming makes wildfires and hurricanes and floods more disastrous, theirs is a growing industry. Resilience workers are the essential workers of the climate change era. And Sockets work with them started in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. 
Now, with his organization, Resilience Force, he follows climate disasters to protect these workers, supporting them as this new resilience workforce rebuilds our homes and our cities. Sakat, I'm so glad you're here. And before I start with questions, I want to ask our viewers to see something very powerful. Sakat and the Resilience Force were recently the subject of a controversial Netflix documentary called Immigration Nation. It showed how Trump's immigration agents round up these workers. In fact, the Trump administration tried to get Immigration Nation premier delayed until after the election. Please take a look at this short clip from the docuseries. Raise your hand if you worked after Hurricane Anne. Many of you worked after Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, right? What about Hurricane Ike? What about Hurricane Sandy? Irma, Florida. Right now we have people who say, well, we don't want the undocumented in our neighborhoods in our cities, but it's okay if they fix our roofs. ¿Cuáles son una de las cosas que tenemos en común? Accidentes laborales. Accidentes laborales. Maltrato laboral. Maltrato laboral, ok. Nos robaron el salario y bueno, por eso estoy hoy acá. Por eso eh, me siento identificada con todos ustedes. We have to convince Florida we want the freedom to work. We want the liberty to get to our job. And it's possible to win that. But we have to have organization. ICE is an organization. The government of Bay County is, is an organization. So we are not going to be able to get what we want unless we are an organization. We won't be able to get anything alone. If you agree strongly with this goal of building organization, then I would invite you all to stand up. Wow. I'm so, uh, I'm so grateful you're here, Saka, to help us address the immigration crisis, the climate crisis that has caused it as well as the empathy crisis. Welcome. Thank you, Jane. Thank you for having me on. And congratulations on um, the launch of this really incredible and important book at this time. Oh, yeah, you're in the book. <laughs> See, Docket was in DC with us. He spoke at one of our Fire Grill Fridays in DC, which is how I know him. Um, let me start by asking you this, Saka. Can you talk a little bit about who these people are that were shown in, in the clip? Yeah, Jane, these are resilience workers. Um, you know, they are people whose heart, whose labor, whose talent helps people come home and helps um, cities rebuild. Um, after climate disasters. You know, close to you in California, um, in um, three counties alone, um, there have been, uh, you know, tens of thousands of uh, people evacuated. Uh, I read a number of um, 20,000 California residents displaced from their homes. Um, in the, the fires. In the North Complex fires. Um, you know, Floods um, in the Southeast um, earlier, a few months ago, um, disastrous record-breaking rainfalls burst two dams in Michigan, flooding the cities of Sanford and, um, and Midland. Um, and all of this causes enormous damage. You know, all of our living, all of our uh, infrastructure, our homes, our schools, our hospitals are damaged. Um, and when the floodwaters recede and the, f the fires die down, we depend on workers to put our world back together, the, the rebuilding and recovery start. And um, that's done by resilience workers. These are workers who largely are immigrant workers. Many of them are the climate refugees you've talked about. Many of them come from Honduras and Guatemala, 
Uh, many come from Mexico, the Philippines, India, other countries. Um, and here in the United States, as climate change is making disasters more frequent and more uh, mm. curious, um, their industry is growing. These are the people uh, who roll into town when the fires die down and help build us back. Someone from Oregon here says a half a million people have been evacuated in Oregon. Wow. I noticed that most of them are men, whether it was one woman. How many of the resilience force workers are women? Well, um, you know, it depends on the occupation. After a climate disaster, there are these different roles that people take on. Mm -hmm. One major role is the rebuilding of, of, you know, the physical infrastructure, homes, hospitals, schools. Um, many of those workers are men, um, but a number of them are women. This is the one part of the construction industry that women are coming into. Um, the woman you saw in the clip, um, other women in our organization uh, are from Honduras, from Venezuela, and they're picking up the tools and driving the trucks right into the face of disaster. Um, there are other roles people are playing. Um, resilience workers are working construction. They're also helping to rebuild um, the, the social infrastructure. Uh, these are caregivers, hospital uh, workers, you know, nurses, um, uh, elder care workers. Those, are, those resilience workers are, are women primarily. Uh, there are also emergency workers and, and um, social workers. So there's, um, there's really a, a, a very uh, diverse um, set of people doing this work. Um, and depending on the roles and professions you go into, more men and, or more women. Yeah, I understand. Thank you. Um, and it was clear from that, from that clip that these are uh, veteran resilience workers. They've been through many hurricanes across many states. Um, yeah. Sometimes yeah. climate disasters strike areas that are more hostile to immigrant communities. I, I, want, I want you to tell us about your experience with this in Florida. It's what you told me when we were in DC. How were the resilience workers who came to rebuild received? Well, you know, that was really interesting. Um, the, uh, there was a tragic hurricane called Hurricane Michael that tore through the Florida panhandle in 2018. Um, when it landed, it flattened Mexico Beach, it tore through Panama City, and then um, tornadoes spun off from it, um, leaving homes completely destroyed. The, the, these tornadoes really carved paths through uh, pine trees and, and residential neighborhoods. Um, and the homeowners, the renters, most of the residents in um, that part of Florida are uh, Trump voters, they're deeply conservative. Um, when the governor ran um, and won uh, his election in Florida, uh, he ran uh, on Trump's anti-immigrant platform. So seven out of the 10 voters who live in that area are conservative, identify as deeply conservative. Um, this is the place where Trump famously came and gave his uh, big speech where he asked, what do you do with all those immigrants? And somebody in the audience said, shoot them. And Trump said, you know, only in the panhandle. And in this very part of the country, who appears, lo and behold, to rebuild after uh, this hurricane? Well, it's, it's immigrants from Honduras, from Guatemala, um, from Mexico, people who built after Hurricane Katrina, and Hurricane Florence, Hurricane Harvey, are now in Florida doing the rebuilding. And you know, that really started to change the minds of, um, of these residents, uh, of these homeowners. Um, you know, they started to realize that at the end of the day, um, immigration, the thing that divides us, is actually less important in the scheme of things than this problem we're facing together, this problem we have to solve, working on a problem turned out to be more important than hating each other. Building this community, rebuilding it, turned out to be much more important um, than, than hating each other. And, and, and you know, um, that 
was where we saw this sort of um, power of this workforce. Uh, these immigrant workers hold a special key. Um, we're living in a world where people on the ground have to get together and solve problems and build a more adaptive world. And that's going to be a world in which we're not strangers. That's going to be a world that we're building together. Um, and the only the, the way we're going to do that is, is by welcoming the people who come to, to rebuild. You know, the, the task these workers took on um, and that these homeowners saw them take on was really nothing short of rebuilding America, building a better America, uh, an America more likely to succeed when it faces risk and disaster. And I, I think we showed these residents that that's only going to happen when we work together. Um, we, we really work to build bonds between these immigrant workers and the beneficiaries of, these, of, of their labor. And in the unlikeliest pay, place, the Florida Panhandle, we found a lot of hope. Socket told me there was a, a family who had been refugees in their own state in the Panhandle because their home had been destroyed. And members of, of his, of Socket's resilience force rebuilt the home. Now there was a sign on that door, a handwritten sign with a Sharpie that said, immigrants will be shot. And here immigrants were rebuilding the home. And when the home was rebuilt, they all sat down together for dinner. And um, the son who had written the immigrants will be shot sign had torn it up. That's right, Jane. He said, he said, we don't need this anymore. You know, yeah. and um, later on, he, he told me something um, that always haunted me and that I'll never forget. He said, I hated the person who hated these people. I hated the person I became after the disaster when my lights were out who hated these people. But, but you know, he told me something else, Jane, and, and this is something I think a lot of people in all walks of life are going through right now. You know, this is a gentleman who lived, he was in his 50s. He lived with and took care of his parents who were in their 80s. They were all from Alabama, but they'd lived there for 40 years, 50 years in this unincorporated town in the Florida Panhandle. This was their life, their way of life. And then the hurricane tore through and this man who worked at a, um, a funeral home would drive home in the darkness in Florida. And on the way home one night, he stopped his car and looked outside because he thought he was lost. He'd done this drive every day for years, for decades. But after this climate disaster, it was darkness all around and he stopped and he didn't recognize his own home. You know, he was so disoriented. He didn't recognize where he was. He thought he was lost. He had taken a wrong turn um, and he couldn't find his way home. And, you know, you just think about that experience, how disorienting that must be. The way of life, you know, the place, you know, in an instant gone because of the choices people made, people more powerful than you. And he's lost. And then he needs someone to save him. And who saves him? It's the person he never thought he would ever encounter, let alone become friends with. The worker from Honduras, the worker from Guatemala, the stranger um, who came and connected with him. And I just think that's a metaphor for our climate crisis. You know, we're going to be saved by the people who we thought we'd never even meet. But, you know, somehow we've been brought together. And the only choice we have, the only chance we have is to work together. So beautiful, thanks for that. You know, I just read that 40% of the US population lives in places susceptible to a sea level rise of just three feet. So, you know, clearly there's gonna be a lot more people who are internal refugees within this country. So your resilience force is gonna become more and more important um, and you've talked to me about how the term climate refugees evokes someone far away, but th this is not a far away problem, right? Can, can you explain that more? Well, you know, you're absolutely right in many ways. Um, you know, we're, we're all one hurricane, one tornado, um, 
you know, one rainstorm, one broken down dam away from becoming displaced by climate change. All those people in the Midwest three months ago, living in Midland, caring about their lives in Michigan, you know, they lived downstream of an archaic dam um, that couldn't stay together after historic rainfall. They became climate refugees. Um, you know, two weeks ago, Hurricane Laura made landfall in Lake Charles, a, a place that is built um, among a dense thicket of petrochemical plants that have polluted uh, Louisiana and, and put toxins into the air, you know, for decades since the 50s. You know, well, here comes a hurricane, the place is blown apart. Now, 10,000 evacuees are living in New Orleans. They are climate refugees. But the people you saw in this clip, the Honduran workers, who were many of whom, one of the gentlemen you saw was a fisherman who came from a farm working family in the south of Honduras. But over the course of a decade, crops failed, um, ocean levels rose, and he had to migrate. He came to Dallas in 2005, and then Katrina hit, and he came to New Orleans for a rebuilding job. He's a climate refugee. So, you know, climate change is going to make migrants out of all of us. Uh, no one's safe from this. Everyone's vulnerable. And uh, I may feel secure in my place today, but may need a place on your couch tomorrow. Um, yeah. We're all in this swirl here. So do, do we need to redefine who is a refugee? What would the new definition be? Well, in two ways, two important ways, we need to define, um, you know, we need to define, redefine how, uh, what a refugee is. Well, one is, um, you know, we, we really need to um, understand that climate refugees are not some far away abstract group of people who are years away from coming and will have to figure out an immigration policy when they arrive. They're already here. They're us. Um, the newest kind of refugee is US born uh, with all their papers and passports intact who had to leave Florida or Iowa or Michigan. Um, Oregon. Or, or Oregon, you know, 10% of Oregon displaced. Um, there's been more land burned so far in the beginning of fire season in California than in the entire fire season um, last year. Um, and where are all those people going? And more importantly, who's responsible for them? You know, it really, one way to redefine a refugee uh, is all of those people need to be the responsibility of the government. The government needs to find places for them, needs to repatriate them, uh, needs to care for them, um, you know, they need to become a public concern. Mm -hmm. And as far as the people coming from other countries, you know, um, Jane, you, you, you spoke about climate apartheid. And, you know, you're absolutely right. Those people coming from Honduras are not coming because of heat created by Honduran emo emissions. They're coming because of heat created largely by U.S. emissions largely created when U.S. elected officials give permits to petrochemical plants, right? Yeah. Um, allowing them to come in would not be an act of benevolence. It would be an act of reparations. We owe the people that our climate policies, our energy policies, our actions are displacing. And once here, um, we need to give them more than a foothold. Uh, we need to give them full status when they arrive. So, so the most important thing um, is, is creating a legal status as part of the Green New Deal, creating a legal status that fully accepts and embraces the refugees we are creating who are at our doorstep. Yeah. You know, outside of um, a failing to recognize climate refugees, how, how else does our current immigration system intersect with the work of resilience workers and, and other essential workers? Well, resilience workers, a vast proportion of resilience workers are undocumented. Um, you know, this is similar to a vast, project, uh, uh, a vast uh, proportion of farm workers, a vast proportion of janitors in some places. Um, not only is a large 
uh, a, a proportion of these people immigrants, but among the immigrants, um, while many are documented, many are undocumented. Um, and, you know, even as mayors and governors and homeowners and renters depend on these workers, and they do, I mean, these workers are the difference between our coming home and our never coming home. Uh, these workers are the difference between a city getting rebuilt or a city's tax base evaporating and the entire city falling to its knees. You know, these workers are quite literally coming and rebuilding cities um, and, and saving these societies. And even as they do it, Trump's deportation forces are hunting them down. You know, when uh, we were in Florida, we would hear these stories. Um, workers would be rebuilding their homes, uh, rebuilding the homes. Um, and, you know, they'd hear sirens and they'd be taken right off of roofs and put into cars and taken to the Bay County Jail. You know, um, deportation forces would show up at workplaces, would show up on streets, would um, go hunting for workers, make a sport out of filling the jails and detention centers. And really the question is why? I mean, this is an immigration policy that is at cross purposes with the recovery of, of these towns. But, um, but it was nonetheless, that was the policy. So, you know, uh, th this is an example of, you know, uh, Trump's deportation force um, interrupting the recovery of his own voters and his own uh, constituents, and yet it continues. And he does it just to appeal to the, to the scared, out of work, working class that, that, that think that the problem is, is the immigrants and, and they don't understand what, the real, what the, the real problem is that's putting them in the position they do, like um, capitalism. That's right. That's right. I mean, he, he, he does it, he does it to build a convenient enemy, yeah. you know, a, a, a convenient uh, opponent. Um, uh, and, and, and it's really what it is, is, um, you know, the, the perfect mixture of racism and opportunism, you know, um, yeah. it is, it is uh, building up, um, you know, building up a, 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 an entirely mythical threat for a community that is actually depending on the person who's supposed to be that threat. Yeah, yeah. You know, these, the workers that are in the clip that, that we saw, these workers remind me a lot of the men and women who are working here in California in the San Joaquin Valley, the breadbasket of the United States, right? Um, many of whom are, or most of whom even are undocumented. They spend endless hours in the pitiless heat bent over harvesting our food and without proper protective gear, barely earning enough money to make ends meet with toxic pesticides sprayed on them. Do you, do you think the pandemic has, has opened people's eyes to what these essential, even though they may be undocumented workers are put through and what they're risking and sacrificing for us? Have you noticed a shift in attitude since the pandemic? To your resilience force. For I think example. you're absolutely right. I think that there's a huge shift. Um, it's been a shift in awareness um, across America. Um, you know, we have had. I think it's a it's a very profound thing that's happened in our culture. I, I think we all understand whether or not we say it that one way of life is ending, and another way of life is beginning for us, um, and not just in America, but really this is the end of something for human civilization and the beginning of another thing, you know? And, um, and we do things differently. We, um, we hug masked strangers, we greet them, we um, put on masks. Um, some of us stay home while others work. And, and one of the things that we do differently is we suddenly maintain an awareness of our interdependence. And something that started happening, which was astonishing, was the way that across America, people would climb up to their balconies or go outside at shift change every day and clap for essential workers. You know, that shows that there's been a, 
a, a real awareness uh, of not just doctors uh, and nurses, but farm workers, grocery workers, you know, the people who keep us um, resilient and, and able to carry on. The, the thing that we need now is we need to, we need to turn the applause those workers are coming, getting into the security they need. We need to translate this applause that they're getting into the protections uh, they need. And, 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 you know, the farm workers in the San Joaquin Valley and, and everyone else, um, you know, these are immigrant workers and we need to say again and again, immigrants are essential. Immigrants are not a threat. Immigrants are not the problem. Immigrants are essential workers. Immigrants are essential in the pandemic and in the climate change uh, era, that immigrants are essential. And, and you know, those workers in San Joaquin Valley, farm workers everywhere, um, every immigrant essential worker, they need PPE, they need gloves, but they need one other thing, which is they need immediate legal status. Nobody who is an essential worker should be undocumented. We can just do that as America with the stroke of a pen. That's what those farm workers need. In the context of the pandemic, many people have been advocating for greater protections and, and support for essential workers. If resilience workers are the essential workers of the climate change era, what do we need to do to strengthen and support this workforce? Well, um, uh, you know, again, you know, many of these workers are, um, you know, undocumented. Many are documented. They have TPS or are in line for polit political asylum, but that's still a, a tenuous foothold in America. Um, these are essentially unrecognized Americans. The work they're doing, the contributions they're making, the bonds they're building, um, these are Americans and they're getting their citizenship in a bottom-up way through the bonds they're building with their neighbors, with their beneficiaries. Um, they just need to be recognized for it. They need recognition. But beyond that, you know, Jane, um, when, when I go to um, disaster areas, um, you know, the Florida Panhandle, or um, when I hear from workers um, after Katrina or in Michigan after the dam breaks or Iowa or California, um, you know, the way that these workers are living, um, calls up, recalls nothing more vividly than the grapes of wrath. I mean, these are workers who are um, rolling into a devastated landscape, living in their cars, living in the buildings they're rebuilding. You know, they're breathing mold. No one's providing housing from them, for them. No one's giving them harnesses. No one's giving them gloves or, uh, or PPE. They're often being pushed um, to um, climb up um, roofs to fix those roofs while it's raining. They're slipping and falling. And when they get hurt, you know, hospitals aren't admitting them. These are really workers who are essential and we're treating them as disposable. And so, you know, they need legal status. And then at the end of the day, they just need to be um, given the protections they need, the housing, the equipment, all of these things that we need. That's much of what we do as the organization, but it's really the government's job. We're doing the job of the US government when we come in and we distribute PPE. That's something um, that the government should do. And if, if they did it, then recoveries would happen more smoothly and quicker. People would come into their homes faster. So everybody that's watching now, think about how important November is. Socket said it's the government that should be taking care of these essential workers that are rebuilding our country. We, we need to get someone in office who will care about them, who will make things right for them. That's why it's so important to vote, right Socket? We've, we have to change the government and make sure that it works for us, the people. But what if we don't? What's at stake for our communities if we don't address these issues? I think the stakes have never been higher. Um, the stakes for us, the stakes for these communities that are rebuilding, the stakes for immigrants, the stakes for all of us have, have never uh, been higher. You know, uh, Jane, um, uh, 
uh, a few months ago in Michigan, um, there was, as I said, you know, uh, massive catastrophic rains, the kind that hadn't been seen in hundreds of years. And two dams broke. And downstream of those dams were the cities of Midland and Sanford. And 10,000 people had to evacuate. We're all living downstream of a dam that is about to break. If we don't vote, if we don't fix things, if we don't elect a government that can take responsibility for making America more resilient, for helping us all face future risk stronger, smarter, um, if we don't repair and rebuild our infrastructure, not just our homes and our roads, but our social safety net, our social fabric, our healthcare system, you know, we are all living downstream of a dam that is about to break. And um, if you have ever lived in a flood zone when that hurricane has come, or if you're living in California or Oregon right now, where the fires are slowly creeping towards you, the sky is orange one day, purple another, and you're waiting for it to be maroon, it will be maroon skies for four years. It will be flooding for four years. So I'm with Jane here. Um, I, you know, I, I can't say it enough. It, you know, vote. If you have family members who are on the fence, make sure they vote. If you kind of have a friend, if you're outside of America, but have a friend in the United States, make sure they vote. Um, because nothing less, I mean, four years ago, it was our country at stake. It is now humanity at stake. So I get the, we know that your organization Resilience Force is on the front lines of our climate crisis right now in California, after the wildfires in Louisiana, after Hurricane Laura in Iowa, after the massive storm. What, what can people do right now? Well, thank you for asking. You know, um, we're gonna be, we're right in the beginning of hurricane season. Um, we've already seen, you know, two or three big ones. We're right at the beginning of fire season. Um, this fire season has burned down more land than um, the entire California fire season last year. So we're really right at the beginning. And throughout the next six months, through the end of the year, we will be going into disaster zones to support the workers who are rebuilding. So what you can do right now is go to resilienceforce.org and support us. Um, support us, um, you know, sign up, uh, watch for our calls to action, and just accompany us in spirit into these disaster zones to make recoveries possible for Americans who need it most. Okay, I think that there is some information in the chat room about how people can um, donate to Resilience Force, am I right? That's right. But in the meantime, while people check in the, in the task force, I want to ask Maddie for audience questions. We have about 10 minutes for audience questions. Thanks, Jane and Saket. Um, so from Lisa on Twitter, what can we do right now to help from our homes or wherever we are? Well, um, you know, two things. I mean, um, firstly, I would just say, you know, get yourself and everyone you know to join something. Join something right now. Join Fire Drill Fridays. Join Resilience Force. Join your local organization, your local you know, uh, group in your local place that's trying to make change. We can't do this alone. So just join something. If you, wanna, um, if you want to support a just recovery, um, then you know, sign up for Resilience Force and, and, and we'll uh, bring you into our actions. Um, join Fire Drill Fridays. But I, I think more than anything else, just in the next one month, every conversation we can have that gets people who might worry about whether they make a difference, you know, to overcome that worry and get them to vote, that's what we need to do most. From Tanner on Zoom, is there any existing regulation to protect workers or does it depend on where they are or where they live? Are people actually making sure that the migrant workers are getting enough water, sun protection, PPE, etc.? Well, you know, um, this is a really great question. Um, what's happening is that um, 
large companies, large corporations, um, instead of taking responsibility for these workers, um, are pushing themselves as away from responsibility as possible. They're lobbying in Congress um, for the ability not to be held liable for what happens to these workers. Um, they're pressuring governors um, to shield them from responsibility. Um, they're doing everything in their power to make sure not just those resilience workers, the rebuilding workers, but farm workers in California and Oregon and everyone else is out on their own. So, um, you know, it, it, it is really important um, that our elected officials at every level, mayors, city council members, mayors, uh, governors, um, members of Congress, um, that they hear from us that, um, that these workers um, need to be somebody's responsibility that companies can't just cast them away. Great. Um, from Jessica on Facebook, it's great to hear that there are things we can do to better the conditions of migrant workers, but even with better protective gear and hours and protection, these wildfires and heat waves and other climate disasters are going to continue happening where these people are working. I live in California and know things are getting way worse here. What do we do about that? What are our leaders doing about that? Jane, do you want to take that? Yes, I do. I'm dying. To... <laughs> the most important thing Californians can do right now is persuade and pressure our governor, Gavin Newsom, to stop signing new permits for fossil fuel drilling and fracking. I mean, he, you know, he's saying that these fires have to make us realize that climate crisis is here and it's real. And I'm glad he's doing that. And there's a lot of good things that he's doing, but he keeps signing new permits for fossil fuel. That's the root cause of the climate crisis. Why is he so in, it, stuck on being married to fossil fuels? So stopping him from doing that is the critical thing because California is and Texas, we're the states that produce oil in this country primarily, and our oil is worse than the tar sands oil. It's dirty oil. If we shut down our orphaned and, and, and mitigated and cleaned up our orphaned wells and didn't have any new drilling, we would be in such great shape and we would send a signal to the rest of the country and the rest of the world, and Gavin Newsom would become a major hero. So we have to get him to do that. Your turn, Socket. <laughs> I couldn't agree with you more. You know, I couldn't agree with you more. And I, I think that, um, you know, we really have to create a what side are you on moment um, for governors who are with us on ending the climate crisis, but then turn right around uh, and give permits uh, to petrochemical com companies. They, they, they enter into mega deals with um, you know, with oil companies, they allow uh, completely unsustainable development, um, you know, on lands um, where development shouldn't be happening. I mean, so I totally agree, Jane. Um, and and um, 1,500 permits he signed this year. 1,500. That's yeah, that's unconscionable. What are the other questions? You got any more questions or is, no, we still have time for more questions. Yeah, we still definitely have questions. And um, that was great. From Jimmy on Zoom, what do we say to our close-minded family members who say that immigrants are taking jobs away from Americans? Hmm. The definitive question, this is a good one. Yeah, this is a good question. Well, um, I guess, you know, I think what I would really say to that is, um, instead of saying something to that family member, I would really sit down and ask, how did you come to that conclusion? Like, what happened so that that became the story? Um, you know, I don't think you're gonna convince that family members through facts and figures, although all the facts and figures exist to show that Immigrants are not stealing work from anyone. You know, what's really happening is um, companies are coming in to industries and they're taking jobs that were good jobs and turning them into bad jobs. 
They're doing it by subcontracting those jobs. They're doing it um, by eradicating the safety net that used to come with those jobs. Uh, they're doing it through union busting, fighting the unionization of those jobs. You know, when unions existed, those jobs were good. When unions were uh, withered away, those jobs became bad jobs to the point where most Americans can't afford those jobs. The only people who can afford to have low paid jobs are the most desperate. They are often rural people, immigrants, uh, African-Americans at the bottom of the labor market. So it's, you know, the more desperate you are, the more you can really afford the worst job. That's what's happening. I wouldn't suggest you take your family members through that uh, narrative. I would suggest you really listen to them and ask them, how did you come up with that um, conclusion? When did the immigrant become the enemy in the, in the story about how jobs went away, where they went away? Um, the truth is no one took anybody's job, um, but a lot of good jobs became very bad jobs. Um, and the same people who benefit from the climate crisis are benefiting from that. Great answer. From Sim on Twitter, I live in California. Is there anything I can do in person to help? Should or could I be dropping off N95 masks, water or school supplies for children? Does that help? You want to take that chain or should I? You, you, you take it. Well, I, I just think that um, wherever you live, um, there are people who are more vulnerable or less. And we all have to look out for the more vulnerable. Um, if you're insured, um, then look out for someone who's uninsured. Um, you know, if you um, don't have kids, make sure someone you know who has kids has everything they need, the additional care. Um, and yeah, water, flashlights, N95 masks. Um, these are the basics that people will need to survive. And um, if you're living in an area where you can stockpile those, don't keep them to yourself. Share them, pass them out. Mm -hmm. Also ask people, you know, if, when people deliver your food or deliver packages or, you know, you see people that could be immigrants, maybe undocumented immigrants, doing things for you or your neighbors or your communities, ask them what they need. If, if it's a worker bringing you something and if, if you can afford it, um, tip larger than you normally would. Um, if you can't tip, ask what they need. Maybe, you know, I remember years ago, I was married to somebody that had a ranch in New Mexico out in the middle of nowhere. And we were asleep in bed and there were knocks and it was migrant workers who were crossing the desert trying to get help. And they were hungry and thirsty. And my husband was scared to death and he didn't want to go to the door, but I, I, could, I could just imagine what they'd been through. And so I just put a, a lot of food in a bag and some water and gave it to them. You know, it can be as, as, simple, as simple as that. Yeah, and I see in the chat, um, uh, someone's talking about gardeners and, and that's right, there's a whole, so there's a whole um, support system you know, that includes domestic workers, gardeners, restaurant workers, um, you know, care workers. And I would just say, you know, if you've had those workers be a part of your life and supporting your life, um, and if, you know, if you have the means, just continue to pay them during this crisis. You know, they're depending on you. Uh, and if you have the means, just, just continue to pay them for the next two weeks so that um, they can they can have something um, to to live on so that they can um, yeah. continue. There are organizations in your area, whether it's National Domestic Worker Alliance or uh, the Restaurant Opportunity Center. You know, there'll be Fair worker way. centers. Yeah, worker centers in your area who you can also contribute to. Uh, you could probably go online and look up how to support those specific essential workers. Yeah. Thanks, I, just, I love what you're doing, Socket, and I, and I love how you talk about it. And there's no question that as we, as we face all the crises that we're facing now, let's 
try with every ounce of our being to move forward with open hearts and compassion. We'll be helping ourselves as, as well as other people. We are, we have come to the end of our program. Thank you, Socket. Thank you, Jane. I'm everything I can to support your work. Thank um, you for everything you're doing in this fight. And please, those of you who are watching, make sure to visit firedrillfridays.com slash how to help to follow through with the calls to action that Socket has shared. And before, before we wrap up, I want to share some, some good news. I'm not going to bring out my xylophone for this one, though. Our, <laughs> our, electric, our electoral organizing program is hard at work, and we need your help now more than ever. And you can help us text or call potential voters, join a leadership committee to help train new volunteers, or for our Spanish-speaking supporters, help to engage the Latinx community around the election. This is all such important work, I can't tell you. Please visit firedrillfridays.com team to join a volunteer team today. And uh, lastly, there's my book. <laughs> I've been doing interviews for days now. My book has just come out. It's called, What Can I Do? My Path from Climate Despair to Action. And um, I talk about the start of the Fire Drill Fridays movement and all the amazing things that I learned from the activists like Socket and um, the speakers and the experts. And I really hope that you'll grab a copy. You can go to www.janefonda.com slash what can I do to order now. Thank you again, Socket. Thank you so much for all that you do. Thank you at home for joining us. Stay safe and healthy out there. And I will see you next Friday. Ben and Jerry, as in ice cream, are going to be my guests.